Magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, is a very successful tool for biomedical imaging. Many people have had MRIs. I have. You get slid into your body, get slid into a solenoid, a tight tube, in which there is a very large magnetic field. Why do they do that? They put you in this very large magnetic field, which is typically something like uh, 10,000 times the Earth's field or more, to take the spinning nuclear spin, the spinning nuclei, which have magnetic moments, which fill up the, your body, most prominently the protons inside the water molecules and fat molecules, et cetera, inside of your body, and to align those nuclei. But they don't fully align them. These little magnetic moments are very weak. So if you take two magnets, everyone's familiar, you put them together one way, they like sticking. You put them the other way, they don't like it. They're opposed to each other. And so if you place a large magnetic field, it's a very strong magnetic field, the magnets will tend to align with the magnetic field in, in the right kind of way that is energetically favorable. But even a, in a field as large as 10 or 50,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, the little magnetic moments which make up the nuclei inside your body are so weak that they only partially align. There's only a net alignment of one out of 100,000. One out of 100,000. So out of, out of every 100,000 nuclei, there's only one excess pointing up along the field and down, let's say. So that net excess of one in 100,000 gives you a signal you can detect because the other, except for that one excess, they're canceling each other and there's no net magnetization. It does give you a signal you can detect, a weak signal, but a good enough signal to be able to make those beautiful images that you see in conventional MRI. But because it's only one in 100,000 and the signal is reduced by so much, the, the spatial resolution that you can get inside of conventional MRI in a human, let's say, is limited to be something like a millimeter or a little bit smaller. That's the finest uh, structure that one can see, typically. There is a lot of interesting things going on inside of biological tissue, inside of bodies, and et cetera, on scales less than a, than a millimeter. There are thousands and thousands of cells within a, something that's a millimeter on a side. There are important functions that cannot be resolved with MRI. As wonderful as it is to see larger scale things, it is limited. And so people would like to improve the spatial resolution uh, and the signal that you can get from MRI. In addition, there are structures in the body, even with this, even forgetting about this one out of 100,000 uh, problem, even in large magnetic fields, there are structures in the body which are not well imaged uh, because there's nothing there that you can image. And a good example are the lungs. The lungs are 90% empty space. It's mostly gas. There's a filament-like, sponge-like structure with a little bit of tissue, but the vast majority of it is gas space. There's a lot of important things that go on in the lungs. That's where we take oxygen in, exchange it into the blood, bring CO2 back out to the air that we exhale. And yet we can't image the lungs very well. They mostly show up as black holes on, uh, on MRI. Unless there's some real problem of bleeding or something like this, you basically have these black holes in the lungs. So you have this problem of not being able to resolve structures in, in tissue, most tissue, uh, because of this weak magnetization in conventional MRI and things like in the lungs where it's mostly black holes. So over the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of effort amongst physicists and chemists to improve the measurement capabilities of MRI by using so-called hyperpolarized media. That means hyperpolarized means highly polarized or highly magnetized. Rather than this one part in 100,000 magnetization, how about all of them being aligned, or at least half or 10%? It's a lot better than one out of 100,000. So how can you do that? Well, I'll give you a couple examples and, and what, what's, um, what they've led to. One is to use the tools that come from atomic physics, optical and atomic physics, very similar to what's done in atomic clocks. By creating with light and done properly, you can take species of atoms and bring essentially close to all of them aligned, where their spins or their magnetic moments all properly aligned. You can do this in weakly interacting gases, and it's particularly effective in weakly interacting gases like helium-3, it's an isotope of the noble gas helium, a non-radioactive isotope. And xenon-129, that's another particular isotope of the noble gas xenon, non-radioactive. Both are very safe for humans. They're noble gases, that are inert gases or rare gases, sometimes called noble, because like the nobles of old, they were standoffish and don't want to interact with the commoners. That means they do not undergo chemical reactions. So, Helium-3, xenon-129, can be highly spin-polarized. They're essentially magnetized gases. They then can be inhaled. So you can take a bag of this gas that's been inhaled. Remember, inhaling helium is, 
is done all the time by divers. It's a, it's a normal thing. They'll mix it with oxygen when they're going on, uh, deep underwater. The reason they replace the nitrogen with helium is the helium does, just resists going into the bloodstream very well. So if you inhale this hyperpolarized or magnetized helium-3 gas, let's say, you find that it fills, it can partially fill the lungs. You want to have some oxygen in there, too, so you don't suffocate, of course. It can fill the lungs and make bright images. And now, for the first time, you can make detailed images of how gas flows through the lungs and all the structure of the lungs. In fact, this has been used to make real-time flowing images of how gas moves in and out of the lungs. For a normal person, you see beautiful uh, detail of filling all the alveolar air sacs and coming back out. Wonderful thing. You can do it in certain ways, either standing up or lying down, depending upon your MRI instrument. You also can see in people with disease states, corruptions. People with emphysema, chronic smokers usually, have had some of the little filamentary walls of the air sacs in their lungs begin to break down. So they have large open voids where the gas comes in and just sits there. Instead of filling up the, and being having good uh, exchange of oxygen and CO2 with the blood, you just have a bunch of gas sitting in big pockets. And you can see this beautifully in these uh, uh, images of hyperpolarized gases. That's what helium-3 can do. It can also tell you the oxygen concentration throughout the lungs. So if you have, it turns out that the helium-3 is so we weakly interacting with its environment, even though you inhale it inside of your body, it stays polarized and magnetized for tens of seconds, longer than you can usually hold your breath. The one thing that can cause the little polarized nuclear spins to flip, typically, is the presence of gaseous oxygen. Oxygen also has a magnetic moment, a rather large one. So the helium-3 gas atoms move by an oxygen molecule, and they can have their spin flip due to the magnetic interaction. This rate at which the helium-3 uh, polarization is lost as a function of time is an indication spatially of the uh, distribution of oxygen in the lungs. So not only can you image where the gas goes, you can image the local concentration of oxygen. And you can do some very interesting things, too. You can find. Uh, that you can image people upright or lying down, and you get very different results. Uh, lying down, you find that the, uh, the, you know, the gas distributes itself, and the blood flow through the bed of your, of your uh, abdomen and across your lungs distributes itself fairly equally. But when you're upright, like I am now, in the gravitational field, there's a pull, there's blood pressure is higher, lower in the body than above, because of the pull of gravity, and that dilates, expands the blood vessels, and you have more rapid blood flow through the lower parts of your lung than you do the upper parts. And so that means that there is um, the oxygen that you inhale tends to linger in the upper parts of the lung and doesn't go into the bloodstream very rapidly and is rapidly taken up in the lower parts of the lung. You inhale the helium-3. You can take images of the helium-3 everywhere, but it go, the, the image intensity dies out more quickly up here because of the higher concentration of oxygen in the upper parts of the lung. So you can use this to map oxygen in different parts of the lung. Xenon, you can do the xenon-129. I mentioned a couple minutes ago, you can do very similar things. But unlike helium-3, a little bit of the xenon is taken up into the blood and then flows around the blood, uh, in the blood, through the body, and can be used uh, as a tracer of blood flow. Even though it's dissolved in the blood, it very slowly loses its spin polarization and magnetization. So it's this bright, unique MRI imageable marker that can be used to study br uh, blood flow through the brain and other parts of the body. And it's a very interesting, uh, again, safe to breathe. Non, eventually, it comes back to the lungs, and you breathe it back out. Does not undergo chemical reactions. Neither helium-3 or xenon-129 undergo any negative effects on the body. Uh, and they're safe, in one case, to image the gas spaces of the lung and oxygen, and in the case of xenon, to do that, plus blood flow through different parts of the body. So these gases, these hyperpolarized noble gases, are one example of a way in which one can uh, surmount or get around the difficulties or the limitations of, uh, of, of conventional MRI. Another one that I'll mention briefly is to take advantage of endogenous, that is, uh, naturally occurring sources of spin polarization, hot spots in the body. That usually happens and can happen when you have a kind of injury. Let's say you have an acute injury and there's a bleed or an inflammation. The, the body responds, boom, somewhere by having uh, a rapid production of free radicals as part of the chemical processes that are trying to repair the body. Those free radicals involved in the repair and the reaction to that injury have a lot of electron spins. The electron spins, the magnetic moment of them, are about a thousand times larger than the local nuclear spins are. So therefore, instead of one part in a hundred thousand spin polarization in a large magnetic field, you can get something like one part in a hundred. 
something like this. And you can, if done properly, transfer that spin polarization from the electron spins to the local nuclear spins using an appropriate kind of technique uh, that can transfer that spin polarization over, which uh, the community has developed, and then make a, conven a conventional MRI image light up locally having to do with the local presence of injury. It's kind of injury image, imaging, and that's all. So you're hyperpolarizing the nuclei based upon transfer of polarization from the electron spins. Very last thing, technology development. It's worth noting is that when you have large spin polarization, hyperpolarization, you don't need the large magnetic field that you have in conventional MRI. In fact, you can build much lower magnetic field systems, which can have a much more open geometry, walk-in systems where somebody can stand or sit down or be free to move and still get very good imaging resolution using these hyperpolarized media, much lower cost systems, et cetera. So myself and my colleagues have been building these sorts of systems for the last several years and we've been in the process and we have transitioned the first of these over to the Massachusetts General Hospital about three years ago where it's now in operation as a research instrument uh, being used on humans and will hopefully lead down the road to uh, a new generation of low cost, low impact, uh, uh, more broadly applicable sort of user-specific uh, imaging tools using hyperpolarized media. I've mentioned the use of hyperpolarized media of, of specific kinds like noble gases and taking advantage of naturally occurring uh, free radicals, electron spins to, to give you enhancement of nuclear spins. It would be great if one could get hyperpolarization, high spin polarization all the time just with the naturally occurring nuclear spins. That's a real challenge. Uh, and you can't take the magnetic fields, which are already large, the very high, high magnetic fields, and make them even higher. Uh, we're reaching technological limitations of what we can do and even safety limitations. So that kind of brute force way to get higher spin polarization uh, is not probably going to work. So uh, one of the great challenges moving forward is how to get the benefit of hyperpolarization without a way for, for all the spins in the body, or at least many of them. And so a frontier area of investigation is to take advantage of special quantum, uh, quantum mechanically correlated spin states, which even if, which instead of giving us high spin polarization, can be in, for example, singlet states where you have two two very similar spins, one spin up and one spin down. Now, when one of them flips, they're correlated, and the other one flips, and so the environment might fluctuate, but they're impervious to that sort of environment. And then briefly, you can flip one instead of the other and be able to boost the signal uh, that way. That's a, that's a cutting edge of investigation, but the real problem is to be able to provide, the real challenge is to be able to try to provide the benefit of hyperpolarization to all spins in the body without, not just those that can be polarized with a laser technique or, or taking advantage of electron spins. Mm -hmm.